On a remote Pacific island lives a mysterious snake that is more toxic than the king cobra. Now, for the first time, a scientist will explore the snake's underwater world to study its deadly venom firsthand. He will discover places never seen before and behavior to baffle the scientific world. This amphibious reptile could kill a human with a single bite. Yet the 1,700 locals live peacefully with their abundant neighbor. And to this day, the islanders honor the legends of their sacred creature. When heavy seas batter the island, locals believe the mighty gods of the southern seas have risen in anger. Snakes are the sea god's messengers. When they emerge in unusual places, it's a warning. Ignore the warning to respect the sea's creatures, and the gods will retaliate without mercy. Respect must be paid and the gods' messengers are sent out in force. <laughs> Legends of snakes and their mythical powers are deeply embedded in the Polynesian world. Here on Niue Island, the people call their sea snake Katuali, and this mysterious creature is found nowhere else on Earth. The Katuali is a member of a very exclusive family the five sea snake species known as sea crates. The Nue sea crate is the most elusive. Of the 70 known sea snakes, only the sea crates live in water and on land. Niue Island is a small Pacific state of 260 square kilometers. Surrounded by coral reefs, it towers 70 meters above the deep blue sea. Tucked away in the southern corner of the vast Pacific Ocean, Niue lies almost 4,000 kilometers east of Australia. How the snake's ancestor first reached these remote shores is unknown, but it has evolved into the most isolated sea snake in the world. One man determined to trace its origins is Dr. Brian Fry, a toxicologist from Australia. Dr. Fry studies venom he milks from animals all over the globe. Here, he will rely on Brendan Passisi, dive master and advisor with Nue's Department of Fisheries. Together, they will dive deep into the Katuali's unexplored world. Just the bow around here and point it out to sea. Dr. Fry's research could reveal new clues to nature's blueprint, and he hopes to discover an antivenom for the island's serpent. A risky task. I suppose my venom research could be looked at as being on a dangerous mission because I'm constantly traveling to new locations to find animals. And since I specialize in the very understudied animal, that means that I'm often working on the ones where we don't know which, if any, antivenoms will work. 
there's a best guess and it's plausible, but it's not a guarantee. Very little is known about the Nuaean sea kite as facts. Because of its isolated habitat and its difficulty in getting, keeping, and studying, the Nuaean sea snake is unique in the regard of being a virtually unstudied animal. Earlier studies have revealed basic information about the snake but no scientist has ever observed them underwater. Mid-year is the calm, dry season of the South Pacific. It's the perfect time for Brian and Brendan's first venture into the Sea of Snakes. Find the serpent's favorite sites, the scientists explore its breathtaking home. The surprisingly placid animals don't seem to mind Brian's first approaches. The experts notice the high number of mature females cruising the reef, and the reason soon becomes obvious. Mid-year is believed to be the time Catualis lay their eggs, and Brian hopes to discover their secret nursery. Sea crates are unusual because all other marine snakes bear live young. Snake's search for a safe nesting place leads them deep into the unknown, sacred heart of the island. the mere tip of a massive undersea mountain. Its slopes are riddled with plunging shafts and unexplored tunnels. Snake's decisive motion is the only guide through the enclosing darkness. Under the island, they reach a major chamber. Here, the snakes seem to have found their sought-after destination, the secret place where the sea god's messengers begin life. A bubble cave opens like an ancient cathedral. Oh, 
Wow. This is phenomenal. Misty waves of compressing air sweep through with a roar. A warning to respect this sacred place. Dr. Fry finds snakes at rest, clearly exposed. This hidden cave provides a perfect nursery. The females have to lay their clutches above the watermark, as only dry eggs will survive the incubation time. They reach for gaps high up in the cave. Once she has found a dry shelter, she rests to regain her strength for labor. It's time for the scientists to leave the females undisturbed. Within days, the snakes lay their eggs. This small clutch of four soft-shelled eggs is the first seen in the wild. No snake in the world mothers its young after they are born. The safety of the cave is the only protection they will ever have. Limestone Island is made entirely of coral skeletons and forms one of the world's largest coral atolls. Commonly called the Rock of Polynesia, Niue is ideal territory for sea snakes and snake enthusiasts like Brian Fry. Ever since I was a little kid, I've always been fascinated by snakes. My mother was the poor, classic, tormented mother who had to always be very careful going into my room or even doing my laundry. Basically, if it's venomous, I like it. To get up close to his irresistible quarry, Brian needs to catch the slippery reptile by hand. With the true sea snakes and the sea crates, there's a great myth that's abounded, that they have tiny little fangs and that the only place they can bite you is between the fingers. This is completely false. They've got very sharp fangs. They're quite long enough to kill an eel, so obviously it can bite you on the arm with no problem. Any species of sea crate will be, on average, more toxic than a species of cobra. So even though their fangs aren't the biggest in the world, they're still able to puncture your skin. And even though they don't have the largest venom yield in the world, they're still more than able to kill you. Amazingly, the Katuali is not known to have bitten anyone yet. But Dr. Fry must continue his search with great caution. At the southern end of the island, currents can change with treacherous power. According to legend, this is the home of the sea gods.
The main chasm is called Snake Gully. Typically, sea snakes are not known to gather in big numbers. But here in Snake Gully, virtually every pocket is packed with balls of snakes. Never before recorded by scientists, the reasons for these underwater aggregations are still unclear. Why do the Nue sea crates come together and squeeze into every little gap? They might have some form of social communication, but it seems more likely that the packs are formed for safety. Perhaps they are anchoring themselves to the reef to hold on against the strong currents while sleeping. Scientists remain puzzled by these unique gatherings. The Nuean sea crates have movements that we haven't quite figured out yet. One day at places like Snake Gully, there might be 300 snakes there. You go by the next day and there might be 10. This isn't correlated with the movement of the moon, the tides, the current, nothing. So we don't know why they go there and when they go there. But they do know that underwater, snakes never sleep for very long. They're lung breathers, and depending on how active they are, need to frequently surface for air. Every 20 to 60 minutes, each snake has to rise for a fresh breath. The constant movement leads to a pattern local divers call the Curtain of Snakes. Sea snakes are exceptional divers. Rather than two parallel lungs, they have developed one long tube-like lung fitting perfectly within their slender bodies. At the surface, it only takes a few quick breaths and their oxygen capacity is fully restored for the next deep dive. Humans have to carefully adjust to changing water pressure. And as a rule, divers shouldn't ascend faster than their slowest air bubbles rise. For a sea snake, that's a very leisurely pace. And as Brian is about to find out, Katuwalis are very strong swimmers. Their muscular bodies powered by a specially adapted paddle-shaped tail. One of the things I've noticed about the Nuean sea kite versus some of the other sea kites is that it's a much more robust animal. It's not as long as some of the other species, but it's much heavier built and much, much faster in the water. In fact, these things are actually quite hard to keep up with while in scuba. You have to swim as hard as you can to catch one of these guys when they're at full tilt, or even just to stay ahead of it. Diving with a snake is just an absolute blast. You're chasing them through tunnels, you're going upside down, you're standing on your head. So it's just this whirlpool of activity. To me, New Way is basically the lost Eden. First off, because I like snakes, and there's just thousands of snakes here for me to play with. And secondly, as a mad diver, 
I love new adventures and the visibility here is just spectacular. The kind of visibility that you would never get anywhere else. Niue's pristine blue gardens have been preserved for thousands of years. Today, most creatures, including the Katuali, are protected. In traditional law, it is taboo to exploit marine life, and fish are only taken for food. Reef fishing remains the responsibility of local women. Fakahula and her daughter Charlene have to cross the Katuali's path almost every day. There is still a very heavy belief on the island that uh, the snake is powerful. And whenever I come across a Katuali, I am so scared, but at the same time, I try to talk to the, to the Katuali. I will normally say to the Katuali, I come here especially to fish for me and my family. So please, Katuali, you go your way and I will go my way. I'm always scared of the Katuali because there is a special connection with the Katuali and the sea gods. The legend goes on that uh, if the ladies from the eastern side decides to come to the western side of the island by sea, and if the Katuali somehow catch that lady, and he will try to make love to them. And um, if the Katuali uses its whole power, that lady will die. But if the Katuali doesn't use up all his power, then that lady will escape. To me, Katuali has special powers. Other people in the island think so too. And most of the people, they don't want to interfere with the Katuali. We respect them and we care about them and we are afraid about them at the same time. Coral gardens are large feeding grounds, and most residents live on a highly specialized diet. Katuales are believed to feed on small, mostly bottom-dwelling fish. All sea snakes have good eyesight but it seems their vision plays little part in the hunt. To find their prey, they rely on their amazing sense of smell. With their flicking tongue, they taste and identify tiny scent particles in water and air. And they can detect small currents caused by the movement of fish. Their tongue acts like a radar to detect the hiding prey. The reef is crisscrossed with fresh trails of scent, and the snake can follow them with deadly precision. The snake swiftly corners its prey, wrapping its body around the hideout to block any escape.
Its venomous bite paralyzes the muscles, killing the victim rapidly. With no limbs to grasp or kill its catch, venom is crucial to this snake's survival. With one big meal in their belly, they can last for weeks, even months. Dr. Fry has been tracking the snakes for weeks. Now he is ready to collect animals from the deep end. As a general rule, whenever I'm working with a venomous snake, I try to take as many safety precautions as possible. Not only because I'm working with an animal that's potentially deadly, but they seem to be a bit more aggressive than some of the other species of sea kite that I've worked with. After a couple encounters where I've looked down and have found one chewing merrily upon my hand, I've been quite glad that I've been wearing the gloves. Any bite could be fatal until Brian can test an anti -venine. Only mature animals will give sufficient venom samples and Dr. Fry needs plenty. His research might one day lead to breakthroughs in medicine to treat diseases like epilepsy or leukemia. to make sure the snakes surface before they run out of air. A balloon is all it takes to float them up, so he can continue to catch snakes and later milk their venom. With a new ANC crate, on one dive in a half hour, you might collect 50 or 60 snakes and not collect another 200 snakes that you saw on the same dive. So I've seen more sea kites here than I have in my entire life. calm, dry season will soon end, and a trail of broken eggshells leads back to the cave Brian and Brendan explored three months ago. Now the bubble cave guards the snake's new arrivals. the hatchlings are fully equipped with their sense of smell and a pair of venomous fangs. Body coordination will come with practice. From their first sniff of air, the youngsters are completely self-reliant. Instinctively, they retrace their mother's route through the darkness.
The newborns have to quickly find sheltered waters where they will grow up in hiding. Mortality can be very high. In some sea snake species, only 10% of the hatchlings will survive their first year. Even for a toxic predator, life is a constant struggle to eat, but not be eaten. Some reef sharks hunt snakes and seem immune to their venom. Some sweet lips, gropers and deep sea fish will also devour them. But the Katuali's biggest threat lurks in the crevices. Moray eels might not actively hunt snakes, but they will attack anything when provoked. To overcome an aggressor of this size, the snake needs to counter with an extremely potent venom. Only the lucky ones get away in a flash or with broken bones. One unique key to the secret's survival lies hidden in these walls. Here, sea crates can do what no other sea snake can, leave the water for dry land. They are remarkable climbers. Their large belly scales equip them to grab hold of and push against the surface while slithering forwards. They are one of few marine snakes to have kept the broad belly scales from their common ancestor, the land snake. Outside the water, the sea crate can preserve energy and warm up. In a sheltered gap, it can rest, digest, and enjoy an undisturbed sleep in fresh air. When night falls, the reef undergoes an amazing transformation. On first sight, it lies as if abandoned, its bustling daytime residents asleep under the coral. Now the creatures of the night populate the gullies.
But not all day active animals are sleeping. The snake's frequent need for fresh air keeps them moving. Nighttime offers an advantage for the Katuali's hunting trips. With many of its prey asleep, it has a better chance to strike unexpectedly. Any easy meal is gulped down quickly. Afterwards, the snakes are often seen stretching and readjusting their jaws for the next catch. But night also holds its dangers for snakes. Up on the rocks, a constantly hungry predator waits. Striking in a flash, this hardy scavenger isn't threatened by the serpent's deadly bite. Katuali's death is long and painful. The mercy of swiftly killing venom isn't granted to the snake. Dr. Fry has collected animals from all around Nui. Now, he has to tackle the most risky part of his research, the milking of the snakes. When I handle them with bare hands, I feel quite comfortable about it, just simply because I've worked with so many snakes and I have a vast experience with different types of snakes. That said, I've also had more than my fair share of snake bites as a result of my work, since I milk on average three to 500 snakes a year. But there's always a little bit of sort of caution in the background because you're working with an inherently dangerous animal. No matter how placid it is, you might have that one in a thousand that's having a very bad day. And all it takes is one bite for things to go dramatically wrong. The sea crate's fangs are relatively short yet they yield an impressive dose of its dreaded weapon. That's a lot of venom. Both needle-like injection teeth are supplied by a central canal coming from the venom-producing glands along the snake's upper jaws. They also hold replacement fangs ready for use in case the main ones become broken or lost. There's only one antivenom made in the world for sea snakes, and one part of the research will be to determine if the antivenom works. It's certainly never been tested against this species. And then we'll also fully investigate the mode of action of the venom. What part of the body does it hit, and how potently does it hit it? All of this can tell us tremendous things, not just about the venom, but also how different the new INC kite is from some of the other sea kites. season of the South Pacific is the biggest battle Nui has to face every summer.
When tropical storms rage, not even the messenger of the sea gods escapes the almighty elements. Hurricanes can wipe out entire reef systems overnight. Only the strongest creatures will survive the angry season. The people of Nui have also learned to read the forces of the ocean. Billy Talongi is a master fisherman and the Katuali part of his daily life. Most of the fishermen here, they respect the sea snake. Whenever you went out fishing on a canoe, it's there. We went out fishing on a reef, it's there. Swimming, it's there. Whenever you come out to the sea, you always see a snake around you. We still respect that there's sea gods out there. I was brought up by my uh, grandparents, especially my grandfather, to respect the sea snake, because that's a uh, tradition from uh, our forefathers. When I was a kid, I was afraid of them. But when I grow up with the snake, then I know how to handle the snake. Uh, I'm not afraid of them. But heaps of people over here, they're afraid of snakes. Every individual uh, fisherman have their own way of uh, concentration on fishing and all that, like superstitious sometimes. Oh, Makato. Oh. How you here? Oh, oh. I have my own way of saying, don't worry. Come up, come up, my friend. Talk to me. Are there any fish down there? Can you go and chase some of those fish into my bait? Oh, my friend. Come And then all of a sudden, there was a strike. I have uh, encountered uh, many times. I have seen such uh, things happen. While Nui's people stay true to their traditional knowledge, the outside world is only beginning to understand the snake's complex nature. Back home in his laboratory at the Australian Venom Research Unit, Dr. Fry has been comparing the venom of the Nui sea crate to that of other serpents of the land and sea. His tests have now revealed an even more lethal mix of toxins than he expected. What I'm finding in the Katuali venom is that there's two main components in there. The neurotoxin blocks the receptors rather than damaging the nerve ahead of the receptor. Now, the other toxin that we're finding in there is breaking down the muscle. In a fish, this will kill it. In a human, if you survive, you'll have agonizing muscle pain for weeks. So it's been a little bit of a surprise that it's much more muscle damaging than I predicted it would be. 
after we finished in Niue, I went off onto another expedition. And on that one, I got bitten. And the pain was just indescribable. For weeks, I couldn't even walk up a stair. I would put my shoes on, my feet would hurt. I would put my backpack on, my back would sway. So of all the snake bites that I've had, the sea snake bite was by far the hardest to get over. In the work that we've been doing so far on the antivenins, we've found something quite surprising. The antivenom works really, really good. And it reinforces that the sea krites are very, very strongly aligned with the sea snakes and the Australian land snakes, that they're all related to each other. So that they don't represent an Asian invasion of the sea, but rather a second or even a third invasion of the sea by the Australian land snakes. Dr. Fry has only just begun to understand the mysterious Katuali. And again, the snakes surprise with bizarre behavior. It's the beginning of Niue's dry season, and the snakes are about to engage in their high season. The tropical waters have reached their annual peak of 30 degrees Celsius, and the serpents suddenly become very inquisitive. Caravans of excited Katuali start checking out whatever moves. Curiously, they display an obvious fondness for anything bright blue. Yet once they realize it's lifeless, their search resumes for something both blue and moving. Amazingly, to become an object of Katuali desire, it has to be bright blue. Given that most of their environment is that color, it's a puzzling choice. After the first excited days, the snakes start to shadow predator fish and more and more players join in. The Katuali's behavior is baffling. These are the first ever images of their remarkable formations. When the whirlwind meetings come to a halt, the snakes wrap themselves around the coral in a frenzy, possibly searching for food. It's plausible these caravans are triggered by a mutual hunt for seasonal prey. But could they also be the means for a stimulated Katuali to find its mating partner? Now the first couples show obvious interest in each other. The often smaller male starts checking the female for sexual hormones, which signal her readiness to mate. If both are smitten, they sneak away to tie their snake knot in private. For the next few weeks, caravans of love will turn Niue's blue gardens into a whirling sea of snakes.
And as long as respect is paid to this unique creature, the sea gods of Nui will be satisfied.